All right, if we can uh, take your seats, we'll get going here. Good morning. My name is Eric Brittle. I work for the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries out of our Chesapeake office. Um, welcome to session two, biology, ecology. Um, I do have a real uh, quick announcement. If anybody wants to see a in-person snakehead, we had one of our attendees yesterday evening go bow fishing for him and uh, killed a very nice large specimen. It's in a cooler right outside the door here, I think in front of the registration table. I think it was about 13 pounds, right, Jason? Some, some Somewhere in that range. It wasn't really weighed, but uh, there's a very nice specimen right outside the door if you want to see that uh, during your lunch break or anytime during the day. I think we've got it on ice. So to start off things for session two, we have bioenergenetics of the snakehead and Mr. Dwayne Chapman is going to be filling in and giving this talk. So Josh Koo sends his apologies that he couldn't be here for this, and I'll do my best to, uh, um, to give it, do it justice. Um, he's a much better bi bioenergetic scientist than I am. Um, but uh, so First off, I, I wanted to mention what this is really useful for. There's a lot of numbers going to go up on this, on the, uh, on some of these slides, and you, you know you really don't need to remember these numbers. And hopefully, we'll have these things in the, um, in the proceedings when this is this comes out. But uh, all of these data are going to be useful. Some of them for things like the model that we just saw. Uh, we have um, the, you know, the consumption at, at different temperatures and that sort of thing. So, and then also I think you, you know you. With uh, if you know what the fish eat, um, and you know how much, and what the relative contribution, different things in the diet, you can run this thing backwards and see how much. If you know how many snakeheads there are, and, and you can figure out how much they're going to eat, you can do risk assessments and that sort of thing with these data. Um, so, uh, so how'd this get started? Um, the uh, can you hear me without uh, using this microphone? Because I kind of like to see the screen. Um, oh, there I see it. There. Dang it. Sorry. Um, the um, how this really thing that really got started in China was they, you know, if you're familiar with reservoir and lake fisheries in China, they they really most of the fisheries are they're like farms. They consider their lakes farms for fish more than we would consider them a place to go out and have recreation. And, and uh, so, most almost every lake along the Yangtze River, and it, it puts Minnesota to shame in terms of the amount of water uh, that's out there. Um, and the number of lakes, but they, they're all farms for fish, and they stock them, and they harvest the fish in, in, in on an annual basis. And uh, so, but the price, you know, the economy has been improving, and, and uh, so their silver carp is probably the most eaten fish in China. It's the hot dog of China, but uh, the, uh, the it's, you know, it's not a delicacy, but the price of those fish has been, you know, it, people want more expensive things now. So the, the this mark this business is not working as well as it used to because they're producing a whole lot of carp. People want something better, uh, b and also because of they they start uh, um, putting in a lot of fertilizer into these things to increase the 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 <coughs> amount of silver carp they're putting out, and it's causing all kinds of environmental problems. Uh, one of the things that uh, when you stock big head and silver carp, and a lot of times they have been stocked to control blue green algae. One of the things that really happens, though, is you in almost invariably end up with increased phytoplankton productivity because you've removed all the zooplankton, and so you end up with just massive algal blooms uh, of tend to be uh, nano and pico phytoplankton. But uh, so, okay. um, so now what they're doing is they're they're moving away from some of these uh, uh, these old culture techniques that have been popular since the '60s when t when they started to uh, Get the you know the spawning of big head and silver carp in, um, together in a way that really works well, and um, and they're replacing some of those kind of fisheries. They're trying to put a lot of a lot more piscivores in where it used to be. They were always trying to control the pi the, the piscivores so that they could 
maximize the production of silver carp. Now they're actually trying to in introduce pythobores into this mix. And in order to, in part, to control the water quality issues and then also for to answer the, the market demand. So the snakehead is one of the fish that uh, has come into this in a big way. Uh, the snakehead and the mandarin fish and also uh, some elopixies and a few other um, uh, predators are being involved in this. But the snakehead is one of the most important ones because it, it is easy to, to grow, it's easy to handle. Another thing that, that uh, Jocelyn didn't mention on here, it's really easy to get alive to the market where some of the other predator fish are, you know, more difficult to handle, and they like to sell them live in China. For uh, so again, these have this trophic effect. When you put a lot of uh, uh, silver carp into a system, which is the way they've been doing this for a long time, you end up with in huge increases in total phytoplankton biomass and all kinds of problems with water quality. Uh, if you put the, if you, if you change the perciverous fish, you get rid of the zooplankton tiverous small fish and, and up in increase the, the, the zooplankton actually improve your water quality. So that's one of the goals of this. But uh, to be able to plan this out, they, these are, some of these uh, lakes are really highly managed. And just like you would put an aquaculture pond, they have 10,000 hectare lakes that are <coughs> managed like an aquaculture pond. And uh, so they, you really need to, to know these, these, this information about the fish you're, that you're putting there in order to manage it to the optimum uh, productivity. And so this is your, your typical um, uh, bioenergetics model with the, uh, the, you know, the G is your growth and, and then C is consumption, um, F is your, the, 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 uh, the food, the uh, fecal production that is, and the um, U is, is uh, in this case, the, the uh, excretion that's not part of the feces, um, things like the, you know, the urea and stuff that comes out and the energy cost and excretion. Uh, then uh, RS is your is is uh, standard metabolism, and the RA is when the activity metabolism, and the SDA it goes into this thing is a basically the cost of turning a prey fish into snakehead. So uh, the once it's captured. Um, so again, again this he's he's really worked on on this project in a lot of ways to get the actual values. If you, if you look at metab um, most of bioenergetics things that are published, they're borrowing stuff from everywhere. This, in, in this case, we actually have numbers off the snakeheads that Jatu can provide you. So it's just kind of cool that we can put, plug these numbers into a lot of um, models here in the, in the United States. So it's, that's the, the cool part of this. That these, are, these numbers are actually developed off snakehead and we, and we have a pretty much complete bioenergetic model uh, that can, we can just pull off the shelf. Nice, nice little thing to have. Um, the, this is some of the, you know, the standard equipment you have. You got your growth area and you got your respirometer. Um, th and he's done all these different experiments to, put to get the different values that go into that um, that bioenergetic model. Um, so here's the, this is the uh, effect of temp temperature, and he's, he's done all these different temperatures. Uh, and over, he's done this multiple times, by the way. But this is and. Swamp loach, in, in every case, uh, is the, the prey item in all of these studies. Um, so uh, ho hopefully you can see this, but each one of those boxes is a, um, a different temperature. And this is Cmax being the maximum consumption. So this is how much the fish eats when given the food ad libitum. Uh, and you can see how um, the, the, with temperature changes, you know, it, when it's cold, they don't eat much at all. Uh, it, as it goes up, you get a, you get a uh, temperature inc um, uh, increase in consumption. Uh, and again, the across the bottom of the graph, of each one of those little graphs, is the body weight of the fish, right? So as they get bigger, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the, the effect of temperature mass has more, diff has more of an effect. So I'll get rid of that page. Um, the, uh, and this is basically that same uh, thing in a graph that shows that you can, it's a 3D graph to be able to see it. And there's the, there's the, you know, there's the map. So you can plug that into existing models. Um, so uh, S SGR is your standard growth rate, um, excuse me, specific growth rate that is. And um, again, we, with the body weight across the bottom again, um, 
and the uh, uh, um, the SDRs on the left and the vertical axis there axis and uh, what you can see that at the different temperatures the way the things are affected the highest SDR uh, for the for the fish is, is going to be in the upper 20s um, and that again that's been given uh, ad libitum feed uh, so so your op optimum temperature for growth it, you know, one of the things I didn't mention on that uh, earlier slide is that the you can see on those on those figures I'll go back to just for a second is that the smaller fish like it hotter they they grow better when it's hot and that's substantial difference there and I think that's going to be important for us and un understanding that the fish really do the small fish do handle really high temperatures really well whereas they get bigger they don't like the super high temperatures as much um, and so the optimum temperature for growth given that limit of food uh, for the smaller fish in this case uh, for was at 30 centigrade and the optimum temperature for growth uh, for the for a 550 gram fish was uh, 26 so it's quite a bit of difference in, in uh, optimum temperature the uh, body weight and temperature has and ha has an effect on metabolism it all goes into these models um, the uh, if I can get on that page my notes here um, okay not seeing those. Um, but again this is this is with your this is standard metabolism at different temperatures and the uh, you can see from this this figure that again the, at those higher temperatures the larger fish with body weight going across the, the uh, horizontal uh, axis and the and the uh, um, the the metabolism rate on the vertical axis you can see that as the fish gets bigger they their ability to they need a lot more food just to stay alive basically is what that's what's telling you especially for the big ones much less so for the small ones. Um, and again, this is that same figure just graphed all out in three dimensions. Um, yeah, so you didn't have the number. This is uh, this value is this is called the uh, the SDA is basically how much it costs to turn uh, your prey item into snakehead, and it I, I don't have time to go into the um, the the stuff that it takes to build this, but this is this is a uh, a complex procedure that you have to go through to arrive at this thing. It's been done, is what I'm going to tell you. But it's out, the number's out there. You can fit it into your model, and there's a number for you. Um, the, uh, um, it is, again, it's the fourth experiment. He's done the relationship between the biochemical contents of the fish, that's of the snakehead itself, and, and body weight. So, that, again, that plugs into your model. Uh, and so you can see that, uh, uh, and again, these, these graphs are truncated. So that, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't have shown these exactly this way I'd have uh, well um, not I'd put a zero at the bottom <laughs> and but these are not done that way and so ash looks like it's all over the place and, and crazy that's n that's because that number is spread out to the maximum that these values um, and of ash are really not very far apart um, the and so you can see that there is some change w uh, in these different parameters as the fish get bigger again body weights always across the bottom there um, and uh, he he had compared some wild fish to these. Most of these studies are done with laboratory-raised fish. So what this um, this figure does, it tells you that are my laboratory fish similar to what's out there in the wild? Am I, you know, in uh, um, is it do I have a valid test going on? And, and what we're seeing is essentially that they're um, they're pretty much the same as the, as the wild fish, with ex exceptions. The wild fish have um, a little more variability than the than the farmed fish, which makes sense you know you get wild fish you get quite a bit more variability and that's reflected to some extent in the energy content of those fish but in general though the, the numbers are, are the same um, I don't know why Hello Kitty is there the Chinese <laughs> like them a lot <laughs> 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 uh, Hello Kitty is really popular over there uh, so um, the uh, uh, so this is your energy budgets at different ration levels the uh, um, and you can see that uh, uh, as again the uh, you know, it's it's pretty much linear for all of these different you know your your wet weight to to the 
uh, the, the ration. It's, it's, it's very, very linear for all of these and, and very predictable. Um, so the relationship between consumption and fecal uh, and production, again, very, very, uh, nothing surprising there. Um, and uh, consumption and excretion, again, uh, nothing surprising there. But we have, what's really important is that we have these numbers and that you can plug them into your, uh, into your particular uh, model. So it's all these numbers have been done in the laboratory painstakingly with, uh, with real fish, real snakeheads. Uh, Mandarin fish, and, and uh, if you're familiar with it, it's, it's very like a cross between a bass and a, and a, um, a crappie. It's also, it's an ambush predator, very much like the, the snakehead. Um, the, he uses Chinese snakehead in these slides, but he's talking about the northern snakehead. It's the same fish. Uh, and again, both of these two fish are pretty similar in their uh, energy budgets. He's done all this data with mandarin fish too, so when we get mandarin fish over here, <laughs> we'll have the data for that too. <laughs> now mandarin fish is also a really important fish, a very, very uh, high value fish in China. Um, it's like a cross between a bass and a crappie kind of thing. Um, the, uh, so uh, this, these are the tools that you need to uh, um, arrive at a specific growth rate and, and get in your growth efficiency. And um, so this is your, when you change your ration level, you do see a change of, uh, in, the in the efficiency of growth. And um, so, uh, uh, so this, you know, they're doing pretty good at these higher ration levels. You know. And um, again, this is another way to essentially express the same data, um, the growth efficiency. And uh, so when he's, he's uh, taken his data from the, you know, and plugged it into a model and ge generated this bioenergetic model, then he's just taken uh, every the fish and putting them into something and feeding them at these different rates and to see how close his model is. So we have that done as well. And it, it's, that's a pretty good fit, I would say, for, uh, for the um, stuff where you've actually fed a fish and when in, the, in the model that he's done previously generated the model. And uh, this is your uh, specific growth rate and body weight uh, um, relationship uh, that I've predicted. Again, fits pretty darn well. Um, this, is, this, this temperature data is from Wuhan, China. Uh, it, it's, uh, so this is kind of a mean temperature. And he's, uh, he's used this in this case to estimate uh, over an average year a given essentially unlimited food, how fast the fish would grow. And you can see that they're not feeding much at these colder temperatures and they don't grow in the wintertime. Uh, unlike the big-end silver carp, by the way, which do grow in the wintertime. And, uh, and this, again, is a comparison uh, between the observed model uh, uh, and observed and model growth. They're extremely good values. So this, um, this, this is a, I, I would call this a pretty high quality model that we, have, we now have at our, at our fingertips. Uh, so important things. Uh, the uh, optimum temperature for consumption was 28.6, so that's when they're going to eat the most. If, if you're worried about what they're eating, that's an important number. Uh, the maximum growth rate, you know, is again a little bit on both sides of that, depending on whether it's a small fish uh, or a big fish. Uh, we have these data to, to for the energy budget. You can plug into your model, and uh, the uh, uh, and the model seems to be working well. Um, if there's a any questions that you guys have that about this that I can I try to answer them. Um, th this is not my work, but I, um, I'm not a I'm not a bioenergetics expert, but I, I'm not uh, a complete newbie either. So. No, um, <laughs> um, and there's definitely room for that. Uh, as anybody who's done bioenergetics work, though, knows that doing this work with large fish is extremely difficult. And, uh, and uh, um, if, it, if, by the way, uh, we do have a high, uh, high biosecurity facility now that uh, is coming online in, in Columbia with the, the capability to hold big fish. So 
if that is a necessary thing, we do have the capability to generate those numbers in Columbia in a biosecure facility. So we could, and uh, the state of Missouri has indicated that they would let us do about anything in there, as long as we, um, you know, they inspect our facility. I think you're going to find that, that it, oh, uh, the question was um, how would the snakehead growth curve compare to uh, native fishes? And I think you're going to find that they compare relatively similar to other ambush predators. And they would not compare well to, say, a white bass, a uh, chase predator, something like that, or a striped bass. But it's going to be more like a bow fin, it's like what you expect. Well, they're native. Warm water, that's a warm water infection. Uh, cool water. Um, yeah, well, they're native all the way to the Amir River. Um, so, they, and that's, I do know they get them that far north, uh, which is pretty much on line with the lower part of the, of the Great Lakes. Um, they, um, the, in terms of that model, though, you can see that those higher temperatures, they are dropping off, especially the larger ones. And again, if you, I don't know how far you can, you can uh, take that model out for these bigger fish, but uh, the, the larger adult fish are not handling that 35 C very well. They are, you have to eat a lot of food and, and the, to be able to support that body at those very high temperatures. And so I, I don't think this, this, these models would, would indicate that those 35 centigrade is a, good, is a great temperature and it's starting to drop off there. So our next presenter is coming to us from the uh, far north. I understand he had a pretty exciting trip trying to get into town yesterday, but uh, we have Nick LaPointe. He's going to be talking to us about dial feeding and movement activity of northern snakehead. Right on. Let's see here. So I have good news and bad news about my talk, other than it not loading just yet. but. Uh, the, the bad news is that I'm presenting data from the doctoral research that I did about a decade ago. The good news is that I, I haven't presented any of this data or published it yet. So this is a, actually something fresh and uh, I'd like to thank John for kicking my ass to actually get this put together and out for this, uh, for this conference. I'd also like to thank my co-authors, Ryan Saylor and Paul Angermeyer, uh, who both helped collect the data and, uh, and refine this presentation. So uh, as a Overall, I just want to give a bit of background on dial behavior in fishes. Uh, the, the results that I'm going to present are from two different uh, components of our study, one involving telemetry to look at movements over a 24-hour period, and a second uh, using boat electrofishing to uh, examine gut contents and their state of digestion over that same period, uh, and then simply offer some conclusions about the, the behavior of northern snakehead. So we know that across uh, teleos fish is that daylight has a strong selective pressure leading to physical adaptations like uh, the dominance of, of rods in nocturnal fish and cones in the eyes of uh, diurnal fish. It has physiological uh, adaptations uh, like the release of melatonin that, that um, affects dial behavior and then it affects that behavior like uh, activity patterns of, of feeding and, and sleep. Sleep being perhaps a bit of a misnomer um, fish aren't necessarily sleeping, but what they are doing is, is resting during periods where feeding would be inefficient and where they might be at risk of predation. So in our freshwater fish, there's uh, you know, probably 50 to 75% of any fish community would be diurnal, the majority, yellow perch, sunfish, pikes. Uh, maybe 25% would be nocturnal, and uh, these are fish like American eel, burbot, and bofin. 
And then there's a small proportion of fish that are crepuscular, walleye being the best known example. And uh, the challenge with that period is if you're a fish like walleye who has superior vision during that period, you can be a, an excellent predator, but this only makes up about 5% of the, the daylight cycle. So you have to be extremely efficient in that small window to, to specialize in that period. So only about 10% of the fish community uh, exhibits that behavior. So we were curious about uh, where northern snakehead fit into this. So uh, for a related study on um, movement, dispersal, and habitat use, we had equipped or implanted 50 northern snakeheads with radio transmitters, and we decided that we would track a subset of these fish uh, every hour and a half over a 24-hour period in uh, winter and in summer or during the spawning season. We also tried to do this in uh, fall and uh, I think in spring as well, but a couple of our tracking sessions were aborted because of boat problems, whether it's, it's hard to be out there for uh, 24 hours straight. And it's particularly hard to be out there for 24 hours straight in, in the middle of winter. Uh, I'm an avid ice fisherman and deer hunter up in Canada, and I've never been as cold as spending 24 hours on that boat. And I've also never been as happy to see the sunrise. Um, but we did, we managed to pull it off. We tracked uh, eight of our fish over uh, 24 hours in March. And um, we had to sort of uh, pick which fish we would study because in the winter months, some of these fish would become so inactive that they would trip the mortality sensors on the, the radio transmitters, which would uh, go off after eight hours of inactivity. So um, this, this happened regularly throughout the winter, but not, we don't really know how long those fish remain inactive. Uh, they certainly weren't in hibernation, but they did go through these periods of torpor. And one of the fish that we were tracking uh, early in our tracking sessions entered into this and stayed in that state for at least uh, 21 hours. We had our own troubles in July as well. Uh, we were able to track a larger number of fish because it wasn't quite so grueling. Uh, but we had a thunderstorm roll in uh, in the early evening that extended one of our tracking sessions to three hours because we had to park on shore for a bit. And some of those fish moved up into shallow tidal flats where we couldn't get precise locations on them. And, and overall, you know, it's great having 250 locations on these fish over this short period of time, but compared to, to uh, acoustic telemetry technology where you can set out a series of receivers and triangulate on positions and track movements continually, this is pretty sparse data. Uh, the challenge is that technology just doesn't work in the shallow, uh, weedy habitats that, that uh, northern snakeheads inhabit. The, the macrophytes just block the transmission of those. So what we found, uh, as you'd expect, movement rates were higher in summer than in winter, though fish were still, uh, when they weren't completely inactive, were moving around in winter. And uh, fish seem to be moving more actively in the morning than at night, though this difference was only significant in winter. Uh, between morning and night. The other pairwise comparisons that we did weren't, weren't significant, generally because of high individual variability and, and occasional um, large movements made by one individual in a given period. So I actually think just the raw data paints a, a clearer picture of what was happening. And here again, you can sort of, you can very clearly see the higher level of activity during the daytime than at night, though not complete inactivity at night either. Um, and much higher activity in, uh, in summer than in winter. Um, there's a little bit of uh, an indication of maybe more activity in the earlier parts of the night than later. And uh, the one thing that I'll point out that is associated with that thunderstorm is the, the sort of peak in activity after sunset in summer makes it look like crepuscular behavior, but really that's just an artifact of a three hour tracking session when fish had more time to move. So going on to uh, their diet, what we did was uh, captured fish by boat electrofishing uh, over a one month period in both May and in uh, 2007 and 2008. Uh, this is the pre-spawn period and a time when we expected that northern snakeheads would be feeding very actively, so a good time to study their feeding habitats or habits. Uh, and we made sure to sample at all, uh, all hours of, of the day and night. Uh, to, to be able to see when fish had fresh diet items in their stomach. Uh, when we captured a northern snakehead, we killed it immediately with a blow to the head and put it on an ice bath to stop the digestion. And then at the end of the day, we would dissect uh, the snakeheads, preserve their gut contents, and then later identify them in the lab. Uh, we characterized the level of digestion according to uh, a semi-quantitative scale developed by Nelson and Bronmark. Uh, 
to sort of roughly back calculate when these fish were, uh, when these diet items were um, likely captured. Uh, we really couldn't do that to any specific degree of, of accuracy because the level of digestion depends on how many other gut content items were there and the water temperature and so on. But what we could assume is that any fresh items were probably consumed within the past hour or two. Uh, and so here at the top, you can see uh, a killifish that was fresh, uh, just had a bit of its skin digested. And the, the fish at the bottom would be at a low level of digestion with the operculum missing and the, the eye digested as well. So overall, over those two, uh, two year, one month periods, um, we captured 273 northern snakeheads and uh, at least five fish in every one hour period of the 24 hour cycle. So we have sort of relatively good coverage across that, that whole cycle. And uh, Mike's gonna probably give much better information on what snakeheads are eating, but in, in our study, bluegill, uh, banded killifish, and yellow perch were most often consumed. Killifish by the smaller to medium sized snakeheads who usually ate multiple prey items and the larger snakeheads uh, more frequently consumed large yellow perch with a single prey item or a large goldfish. So there was an ontogenetic shift in, in feeding habitats. Um, they also seem to feed opportunistically, opportunistically on other prey items, though the vast majority of their diet was, was fish, uh, much, mo much more so than largemouth bass, which fed uh, extensively on crayfish in the Potomac River. And snakeheads really didn't target that, uh, particularly with their up upturned mouths, it's not a very suitable prey. So um, again, because really the fresh diet items are the ones that give us the best information on when they were captured, I'd, I'd suggest that you focus on the dark green in this figure and the gray, which represents the proportion of fish with empty stomachs and with fresh diet items. And here we do see a pretty clear pattern of the most active feeding occurring uh, during daylight hours. Um, though when we add in the sunset, there, it gets a little stranger. So, the feeding seems to be loaded towards the front end of the day with really limited feeding around evening and apparently some feeding into the early evening. Um, but even more curiously is that gap from 6 to 7 where sunrise was at 6 a.m. and yet we didn't encounter any fresh diet items into, in snakehead stomachs until 7.45. Uh, so these fish aren't feeding right at dawn, they're really waiting until it's fully light out to begin feeding, or at least until they're actively uh, able to capture prey. Um, and in terms of the later parts of the day, what I could conclude from this is that snakeheads like me don't like going to bed hungry. So if they've either digested their earlier prey items or hadn't caught anything yet, it seems like they will continue feeding until they have something in their stomach before they retire for the, the evening. And then in the later parts of the night from one until six in the morning, there were no fresh diet items uh, observed. And so one possible explanation of that little gap at 6 a.m., uh, if you look in on coral reefs, there's this quiet period that's been observed, and it's a transition between diurnal and nocturnal species, where after sunset, the diurnal species settle out, uh, go into hiding, stop foraging, but nocturnal species haven't emerged yet. And so there's sort of a paucity of prey available, um, and that's not really something that's, that's strongly documented in freshwaters but that's one possible explanation of why northern snakeheads aren't feeding until well after sunrise rather than at sunrise. Another possible explanation is that they don't have very good eyesight and they're waiting for sort of full sun to be able to feed, but the fact that they're feeding after dark uh, in the evening suggests that they're, they're able to feed even in, in low light conditions. And then finally, switching gears uh, quickly from dial activity to looking at the, uh, the influence of tide on feeding activity, um, Here's an example of how tides sort of regulate activity in fish from uh, Shani, which is an intertidal blenny. And I, I just thought it was interesting that this is an experiment that was done in a laboratory condition with constant sunlight and no tidal influence, and yet the activity of the fish was clearly correlated with the incidence of the tide at about a 12.5-hour uh, cycle. And that just sort of, the, the fish's internal clock would drift over time as those other cues were, uh, were lost. So we wouldn't expect the same level of uh, response from northern snakeheads, which aren't an intertidal fish. Uh, they evolved in freshwater. But we did see a bit of a pattern with these fish where uh, what I've done here is remove the nighttime samples um, where uh, all fish didn't have fresh diet items. And so during the period when fish were actively feeding, 
there seems to be a, a higher incidence of northern snakeheads uh, capturing fresh diet items on outgoing tides. And uh, again, we wouldn't expect northern snakeheads to, to have evolved to feed with a tidal cycle. What this likely represents is the feeding efficiency of northern snakeheads. So in particular, those banded killifish that are targeted by smaller northern snakeheads uh, have a, a life history where they tend to move, that prey item tends to move onto tidal flats at high tide and then gets swept out as the tide recedes. And we frequently observe northern snakeheads on the edge of those tidal flats likely effectively feeding on that prey item and therefore being more likely to have fresh uh, items in their gut at that time. So overall, I, I think it's pretty safe to say that I, I would characterize northern snakeheads as a diurnal species rather than a nocturnal or crepuscular one. Um, there was really no evidence of feeding at those crepuscular periods and only limited feeding activity at night. Um, it's somewhat surprising given that they're an avian predator and, uh, sorry, given that they're an air breather and therefore during daylight hours they're quite susceptible if they're active to avian predation, but it, you know, likely their eyesight is uh, a stronger influence on their, um, on their choice of feeding time than the risk of predation. Um, and again, one thing to keep in mind about our data set is we only characterized feeding success with this data set rather than feeding effort. Uh, and so we're really only showing when snakeheads are, are best able to capture prey. It doesn't mean they're not active and trying to feed at these other periods as well. The other thing to say is we're really focusing on, um, on feeding activity and a little bit movement, but there are other behaviors that may or may not coincide with the daylight cycle. And so as active nest guarders, for instance, northern snakeheads might be active throughout the 24-hour period when they're guarding a nest and uh, not rest for that activity. The movement rates that we observed were quite similar to those observed using similar methods for largemouth bass in a southern reservoir uh, within a, a similar order of magnitude, so they're not uh, particularly active or inactive fish during those periods. Uh, though they do have a bit of a different feeding period than largemouth bass, which tends to concentrate its feeding at crepuscular periods. So that may um, limit diet overlap to some extent. Uh, in that they, they may be targeting different uh, members of the fish community that are active at those different periods. And in terms of informing future research and management efforts, this gives us a sense of, uh, you know, when to target fish if you're looking to, to understand what they're eating. Uh, it also gives us an ability to predict the risk of predation for potential prey species if we know when those prey species are active. So we would expect that uh, nocturnal prey species, for instance, would be less susceptible to predation than, than diurnal ones. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. Uh, it's a good question. I haven't observed their feeding behavior, only the many bluegill that was in there. Uh, what, you know, what we did observe was that um, they are a very shy species, so we rarely observed them swimming in the open. Um, even when we were on top of tagged fish, uh, you know, we would have to, to sit quietly for 10 minutes before that fish would show itself, and even then it, it had very restricted movement. So they weren't quite as motionless as a northern pike. Um, but certainly not as active as a, as a bass either. Yeah, uh, can you throw my presentation back up? Um, I, I don't want to go into detail about it. I did, uh, we did record that and I did a quick random forest analysis of several other factors to try to, to look at what was influencing this. Um, it, it explained very little of the variation and temperature was actually one of the factors that didn't come out as being important in that model. But of course, we're focusing on a fairly narrow range during the pre-spawn period and uh, I think we need a lot more data uh, during the different times of the day with those sort of daily temperature swings to see how, what influence that might have. Or again, to go back into the, the earlier spring period um, into April when they were less active. Well, 
Interesting. Yeah, it makes sense. So how, how were we able to observe active movement? So the, the way we were doing this from the telemetry study was just actually tracking the physical location of a fish from one period to the next and, and then revisiting it an hour and a half later. And that may uh, lead to that, that individual variation that we saw. So a lot of fish were in the same place or very close to the same place, probably in that ambush mode the entire time. But some of those larger movements, you know, several hundred meters over an hour period, was likely that fish going to find another la ambush location. Or um, from these slides here too, the one thing I'll, I will point out is at the end of the period, you can start to see um, an increase in um, the level of digestion, meaning that fish were feeding less actively towards the end of the season. And that's likely showing the, the onset of the spawning season. So where they're switching from an active feeding behavior to uh, focusing their energy on, on um, finding mates and, and nesting areas. Yeah, so uh, the question was what proportion of fish had nothing in their guts, and I don't have the overall proportion. I would, you know, say that it was in the 30, 40% range. You can kind of see it in each one hour period where during the day it's probably, um, it is lower, it is probably around 30%, but at night it's, it's up to 70%. So I would say it would average around 40, 50%. There's actually a large number of fish that didn't have anything in their gut. All right, thanks everyone. So our next speaker is a good friend of mine, Mike Eisel with the uh, Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, and he's gonna follow up Nick's talk with a uh, talk about uh, snakehead diets in some of the same rivers Nick was working on. All right, thank you very much for the introduction, Eric. So today I'll be presenting on the evaluation of northern snakehead diets in Virginia's tidal rivers and lakes. Um, give a little bit of background information, which I'm sure many of you are already well aware of. Uh, northern snakehead are native to Asia. They're very popular in the aquarium trade, or they were, and also as a food source. They're obligate air breathers, which allow them to live in environments um, under harsher conditions such as low DO. Uh, their parents uh, guard the young, which result in higher survival rates um, for the fry. They prefer shallow vegetated habitats, spring through fall, but in the winter time they move, seems that they move off into deeper water, um, possibly hibernating in the mud. They're ambush predators and become piscivorous at a very early age. And they're well established throughout the Mid-Atlantic region and currently expanding in the Midwest. So this map here I got from the USGS non-indigenous aquatic, aquatic species site. Um, just wanted to show, you know, reiterate how well established they are through the Mid-Atlantic, um, through Northern Virginia, um, Maryland, a little bit of Delaware, and even through southeastern Pennsylvania. There also are a, a few isolated populations uh, throughout the northeast. And then you have the um, area down in Arkansas, which is now expanded into Mississippi. So that probably needs to be updated a little bit. Um, don't 
don't worry about the Lake Michigan observation and the one in North Carolina, as those were a long time ago and those were just one-time observations, haven't been found there since. So a little background here in Virginia. Um, the snake were first documented in the Potomac system in 2004. Um, the range has expanded to other rivers and numerous impoundments throughout the state, mostly within the last five years. Uh, we conduct routine electrofishing surveys, usually about two to three times per month, um, March through October annually. And as Aaron said earlier and showed, um, they were most recently found in the James drainage April this past, this, this year. So this is a map I borrowed from Aaron. Um, again, just wanted to reiterate the, the highest number of observations are in the Potomac drainage. Um, that's where we focus the majority of our work. Um, then they're also pretty well distributed throughout the Rappahannock. Um, you have this couple of lone observations over on the, the eastern shore, which are likely um, from angler introduction or uh, commercial introduction. Uh, in the York drainage, um, they are in, um, right there, that's Lake Anna. It's a 13,000 acre impoundment. They were first found in uh, a couple of years ago. Um, we've only picked up, I want to say, three electrofishing so far, but there's been numerous reports of anglers catching them here recently, so I'm um, guessing their population within that, that lake is probably expanding. Um, and then you have the, the two in the James um, were found in impoundments this past spring. So methods to, to the study, each fish is measured, weighed, and processed. This processing includes otolith extraction, sex identification, fecundity, and stomach contents. Pretty simple. So for the diet analysis, since 2004 from the beginning, we've looked at over 2,200 stomachs. Um, we only used identifiable food items for analysis. Anything um, that was mostly digested, too far gone, um, we did not include in this analysis. Um, we, began taking wedding, we began taking wetted weights in 2014, and for the evaluation, we looked at frequency of occurrence and percent wetted weight of those items. Now, dis despite the many teeth that the snakehead have, it seems that items are always consumed whole. And here I've got a video of our educational display snakehead Stella that we have in the office. And about the eight second mark, you'll see her inhale a shiner. Can you go ahead and play the video? Thank you. Slow down here and there it goes. Gone. So she just sit there and we feed her generally about once a week. We go ahead and feed her a dozen shiners and within 10, 15 minutes. So, as you saw there, they pretty much inhale their, their diet items like a vacuum, um, which uh, lets us see them whole and makes for easier identification. So I've got some pictures of some diet items. First we got an American eel, got the bluegill, frog, yellow perch, and even a brown bullhead. This brown bullhead was about 250 grams, came out of a, uh, an eight pound fish. So for the results on the impoundments, um, those are all relatively newer populations. Um, so we've only been collecting data since 2015. Have a kind of relatively small sample size of only 203. Um, 76 occurrences with identifiable food items or 37% of the time um, comprised of seven different species. Uh, the top three by frequency of occurrence is bluegill, frog, and yellow perch. 
in the top three by percent wooded weight is bluegill, yellow perch, and frog. So just a couple simple bar graphs here. Um, this covers all items, it's all seven items. Uh, for percent, um, by frequency of occurrence, you see the bluegill uh, almost 70% of the time. And bluegill also over 65% of the time by percent wetted weight. Um, not too much of a surprise as in our impoundments, bluegill are the most readily available for consumption. So naturally that's, that's what they're gonna eat. Um, also note there, the, the last item, the snakeheads do in fact eat each other. So on the rivers, we have a much larger, larger data set. Um, we've collected the data since, we've been collecting the data since 2005. We've got 2,057 uh, stomachs were checked, 601 occurrences with identifiable food items for 29% of the time, and 30 different species of food. The top three by frequency of occurrence is the band killifish and bluegill followed by the crayfish, and by percent wetted weight, we have the bluegill, gizzard shad, and banded killifish. So for the rivers, like I said, there was 30 different species consumed. I just want to go ahead and give you the top five. Um, by percent frequency of occurrence, you have the banded killifish and the bluegill pretty much neck and neck, side by side at 31%. And then by percent wetted weight, that's dominated by the bluegill. So I know this is a real busy slide, but you know, being I said there's 30 items consumed in the rivers, just want to put it out there. I've got it sorted out by families and species within the family. Um, the main the main point here is look at the centrarchids and the fundulids. The two of those combined account for pretty much 70 percent of uh, consumption by frequency of occurrence and uh, over 50% of uh, wetted weight. So I wanted to take a look and see if there's any seasonal differences also, um, what they're eating, when they're eating. Um, food is rarely found in stomachs in the early spring. Um, not sure if that's a function of it, um, if they're going to disperse. It seems like they want to disperse in the spring. Um, or, or find a mate, and then it's usually followed by pre-spawn gorging. Um, also, the majority of stomachs um, tend to be found during the spawn, as they're you know they're uh, they guard the nest, um, so they're sitting there guarding the nest or keeping an eye out on the fry. Now, in spring and summer, uh, there's almost a one-to-one -one ratio for bluegill and banded killifish consumption. Uh, the banded killifish do spawn in dense vegetation in June through August, which uh, make them a little more susceptible to predation during that time. Um, and then in the fall, it seemed like there was a, a shift um, to um, being dominated by bluegill, con uh, bluegill consumption by almost a four to one ratio. So for whatever reason, it seems like they shifted from uh, an even split between the two to eating a larger item possibly to, to build up fat reserves for winter. So um, a couple conclusions. Fish account for 98% of the diet. Uh, bluegill, which is non-native to, to the Potomac drainage, um, is the dominant food item by percent frequency of occurrence and wetted weights in our impoundments. Rivers are m more productive than lakes and offer many more food options. The banded killifish and bluegill almost identical in percent frequency of occurrence, which was also seen by Sailor et al. in 2012. And the bluegill are, are largely most common food item by percent wetted weight. So you might ask, northern snakeheads must be having detrimental effect on other species throughout predation and competition. Um, a big concern once these fish were introduced was that they were going to outcompete um, or prey upon the largemouth bass. Um, for this study, from what we've seen, largemouth bass were only found in 14 of 2,260 stomachs for 0.6% of the time. 
So figure we'll go ahead and we've got these data, we've got all this data from when the snakeheads first came in in 2004. We'll look at the long-term trend of largemouth bass, CPUE is on the, the y-axis. Um, the largemouth bass is on a upward linear trend. And the northern snakehead, they took off 2004, peaked out, out in about 2012, and since have been on a slow decline. Um, and this is for our um, main three core creeks up in northern Virginia, which is Little Hunting Creek, Doe Creek, and Pohit Creek. Um, but at about 2012, people started figuring out these fish do taste good. Um, so I'm sure there's a, an increase on harvest for consumption, and bow fishing has really taken off um, over the last few years. So to wrap things up, snakeheads are opportunistic feeders. Um, they eat a wide variety of species and sizes of fish. Um, however, the, the vast majority of their diet is, appears to be uh, composed of just a few species. Centrarchids and fundoids are by far the most common. Um, the Mutzer et al. 2017 found that banded killifish abundance has actually increased in Pohick Bay um, despite predation uh, by northern snakeheads. Um, Again, largemouth bass catch rates are on the incline, while snakehead catch rates are on the decline. Uh, we should continue annual monitoring, and additional research is needed to better understand life history components, uh, such as recruitment and assist with management decisions. And with that, I'll take any questions. Sure. It's possible it is, um, th that's something that we're continuing to, to monitor as far as, you know, the populations that are established in our impoundments. Um, we're monitoring those annually. Uh, we're only three, four years into them really getting our impoundments. To this point, we have not seen any community level shifts. Um, I know the creeks further to the south have been more recently colonized when you go into the tidal rivers. So like Aquia Creek and, and other places, we're still seeing higher catch rates. Our bass catch rates mirror the same thing. I mean, th this year, this spring, we had catch rates in Aquia Creek of over 150 bass an hour. So to this point, we haven't necessarily seen, and the bass are all in good condition, so it's not for a lack of food. Um, but it's just something we'll have to continue to monitor and we'll tell in time. Any other questions? Yes. Um, we've seen. I, I didn't break it out for this. I probably should have looked at it and you know see if there's a difference in sizes. But I know from firsthand. You know we've seen. Um, we've seen large snakeheads with eight or ten band of killifish in it, you know, little three, four gram piece fish. And we've seen them with, you know, the, over a half a pound bullhead in it. Um, you know, obviously they, they do have a very large gape size. They can eat a wide variety of forage. I guess just with them being opportunistic, it's kind of what's what's most readily available at that time. But I, you know, I haven't necessarily broken out and looked at it by size. Sir? Yes. I think it's uh, it's more of a um, uh, availability, a higher abundance. 
um, especially especially in the impoundments. Um, so that's yeah, I, th I think they're opportunistic and you know kind of sharing the same type of habitat and the you know with the SAV. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Um, I guess to, I guess we have the, the American eel, right? And um, and then the, the band of killifish, I guess, further north is kind of over concern. Um, but based on consumption, um, it just seems to be that the centrarchids and the fundulids are, you know, the, the two most dominant families that are being being eaten. Haven't looked at it according to turbidity. Um, that is a good question. Um, our, our three main Greeks that we we do look at, there definitely is a little bit of a difference in, in turbidity. Generally, little hunting Greeks a little bit more turbid. Um, but I have not looked at that. That'd be something to look into, see if there's a, a difference. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. And our last speaker uh, this morning for session two, biology ecology, will be Noah Bressman, and he's got a talk that has some very interesting videos associated with it. I think you'll enjoy. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Um, and I'm going to tell you about snakeheads on land. Um, let's see. There we go. So uh, first, we, we got to discuss uh, fish on land in general. So they're actually a variety of fishes that go onto land for a variety of reasons, like mud skippers, walking catfishes, and Pacific leaping blemmies. They uh, they go on land to avoid. Some go on land to avoid predation. If you can go on land and a predator chasing you can't, that's a good way to get away. You can access new resources. If your tide pool is drying up, but the pool next to you is still has a lot of water, you can simply move to that pool. And some fish will even reproduce on land, like the mass spawning events by California grunions. They lay their eggs on the beach away from aquatic predators. In order to survive on land, you need a bunch of at you need several adaptations. Breathing air on uh, breathing air definitely helps to survive out of the water, and some fish do this cutaneously or through accessory air breathing organs. They try to avoid desiccation, whether it's through adaptations to retain water or like mud skippers, they stay in the mud. And you have to be able to locomote efficiently on land. If you can get on land, but you can't move around and get off land, then you're just stranded. So snakeheads are good at candidates for uh, amphibious behaviors because they breathe air. That helps to survive out of water for long periods of time. And they're native to areas in Southeast Asia that are prone to flooding and droughts, which could potentially strand snakeheads either on land or in very shallow bodies of water. While some studies have tried to describe to some extent, the ability of snakeheads to move on, around on land, they've done that fairly poorly. Uh, about as good as a description as exists in the literature is this cartoon by Walt Disney, which basically just says they wriggle over land to the next pond. And that's as much of a kinematic description as any other paper. So the northern snakehead is a species that I focused on. Uh, they're invasive of the US. Uh, their range expansion seems to be correlated with flooding events. When there's more flooding, they spread uh, to more areas. And there's conflicting evidence that for their terrestrial behaviors. Some people say they can move around the land, some people can't. So I'm here to settle this debate. Can snakeheads efficiently, can Chana Argus effectively move over land? If so, how do they do it? How do they compare to other amphibious fishes? And why do they move around on land? So first, uh, with the help of the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, uh, I collected snakeheads uh, via electrofishing in the Nanjamoy River in Maryland. We filmed individuals on multiple substrates uh, to see their kinematics. And the substrates include bench liner, 
grass, a rubber boat deck, one of the ones just got little grippers so you don't slip, uh, both on a flat boat and on a tilted boat by having a couple people on one side of the boat to give it a little bit of a slope, as well as an artificial turf. Uh, also use some EMG, but I'll discuss that a little bit later. Once using the videos of the snakeheads crawling on different substrates, uh, I was able to analyze the kinematics. How do they move? And did that using uh, digitization, essentially landmark tracking, where I tracked the tip of the snout, the center of mass, and the tip of the tail, uh, frame by frame through videos to quantify and describe how they're moving on the land. And I did this in MATLAB. This data gives me information that I can use to determine the wave amplitude, which is the percent body length that a body part moves laterally relative to the overall body length. The distance ratio, which is a net distance divided by the total distance. So a distance ratio of one means you're keeping your body completely still and just moving forward. A distance ratio close to zero means you're moving your body side to side a lot, uh, but moving forward very little. Uh, stride frequency is how quickly are these behaviors being performed and velocity is how quickly are they moving. And using um, all this information, I performed an analysis in R. Specifically, I did a MANCOVA to see how all these performance aspects compare under different uh, substrates. So here is the first video uh, I will show you. Um, here's a snakehead on land. Uh, so is there. Notice how it's yeah, there we go. much finer with actual yes. body movements. That's what I want. It's okay. not making great yeah, progress, but it is moving anteriorly. It's moving forward on a flat substrate, and it's uh, doing so using a form of locomotion called axial appendage-based locomotion. It's using both its actual body and its appendages. Now, in the next video, is this is a intertidal sculpin, a ligicotus maculosus, and it also uses actual appendage-based terrestrial locomotion. And um, currently describing their behavior in a manuscript and revision, so I will use this fish as a comparison for the snakehead terrestrial behavior. If you notice, if you play that uh, sculpin video again, the video on the right, they use uh, they alternatingly use their pectoral fins while using their body. Whereas, can you play the video on the left? The snakeheads um, they move both pectoral uh, fins roughly at the same time. Yeah, there we go. Yes. So that's what so I they want. May have to, they may have to okay. use the pectoral fins differently back. than the sculpins, which simply alternate, plant a pectoral fin on the ground, and rotate their body by pushing with their tail, and then they plant their other pectoral fin and they alternate. Additionally, the sculpins are moving much more faster. The sculpin video is actually slowed down seven times, whereas the snakehead video is not slowed down. And the sculpins move about uh, 10 hertz, so they're doing these behaviors extremely quickly, whereas the Snakeheads are moving less than one hertz, so they're moving pretty slow in their oscillations, and the sculpins are moving quick more uh, more quickly, almost 10 centimeters per second, whereas the snakeheads are moving about four centimeters per second. Additionally, the sculpin in this video is about six centimeters, and the snakehead in this video is about 60 centimeters. So there's an order of magnitude difference. Uh, so the snakeheads may have to move their body around on land differently. So in this video. Uh, this is a lateral view of the snakehead, and here's how it looks like. Uh, so I'm like, oh, you can see the pectoral fins in its actual body, uh, and it's oh, the actual escaping. body. Oh, oh, it's yeah. straight. Whereas in the next video, um, you have a tideful sculpin moving, and it rotates, it rolls over its pectoral fin, and actually lifts its mid body off the ground. So it's actually able to lift its body up and forward, whereas the snakeheads, potentially because they're much larger, they can't support their full body weight on their pectoral fins, so they have to essentially drag their body along the substrate. And so here uh, is a kinematic analysis of these sculpins compared to the snakeheads uh, on a bench liner surface. Um, on the left is the distance ratio, which is again the net distance over total distance, and on the right is the wave amplitude, how far laterally is the body moving relative to the overall body length. You can see for both the center of mass for both distance ratio and wave amplitude are fairly similar. The sculpins are, the snakeheads are moving similar, it's moving their center of mass with a similar efficiency as the sculpins, but the snakeheads have a much lower distance ratio for both the head and tail and a higher wave amplitude for the head and tail, suggesting that in order to move the center of body mass about the same amount, 
the sculpt the snake heads have to move their head and tail a lot more to achieve the same uh, performance. And so that means that the uh, potentially because they're so much larger and their pectoral fins are relatively different size compared to their body, they may have to use di different kinematics than the sculpins to move around on land. And but on different substrates, the uh, snake heads perform a little bit differently. Uh, can you play the video on the bottom right? That's the, uh, let's see, the one on the bottom right, is that it? There we go. Do you see this is the video uh, before? Yeah, there we go. Tail and head, they don't yes, that far forward. that's what I wanted. Flat okay, In the top go back. Row, they do these lower amplitude moves. Yeah, this, so it's, it appears like they, they, they just kind of work with it. The rubber, uh, and let's they're see. working with gravity, generally there we go. moving. That's nice. That was nice. A little more efficiently on this substrate. Then on the grass, these guys can basically sprint on grass. They move a lot faster on grass, uh, which, ooh, can you go back? Can you play the grass video, please? Mm. There we go. They move much quick, more quickly. They can actually move yeah. fairly quickly by any fish standard on land. So I use the Mancova to compare how they perform on the different substrates. Uh, I have not finished the analysis for all the turf data, so I left that out. But substrate significantly impacts the performance. It's not very evident in those videos, and in, it uh, affects the distance ratios, wave amplitudes, and velocities. And so I'm not going to go point by point showing you how it affects it, but to give you an overall summary, uh, let's look at velocity. So on grass, they can move about 16 centimeters per second which is much faster than they're moving on the flat bench liner, uh, which is about four uh, centimeters per second. And when you have the tilted boat deck, they move almost as fast at 15.6 centimeters per second, almost as fast as grass. And then on a flat bench, uh, on the flat boat deck, they are moving still faster than the grass, but they're not moving as fast um, as when you, oh, they're moving faster than the bench liner, but they're not moving as fast as the tilted boat, uh, boat deck. So that's showing that the three-dimensionality and the slope of the structure of the substrate can affect their performance on land. Uh, because we're using different fish for the each video, um, we had to factor in length to see if the different sizes of the snakeheads were impacting their performance, and that was found to have a negligible effect. So the size didn't really impact their, their performance, at least in the size range we studied. But if you look at the pectoral fins again in this video, it seems like they're moving, uh, they're moving Roughly at the same time. Yeah, so it appears like they, they just uh, kind of work with it. There we go. Uh, let's the, see. No. They're just kind of sliding go. along. That's nice. Moving both the body and the fins, but it's hard to tell exactly that was what's nice. going on. Which is why we did some electromyography, some EMG. Using fine wire electrodes, we implanted electrodes into 12 locations on the body the anterior and posterior epaxial and hypaxial muscles both on the left and right side, and the pectoral fin abductor and adductor muscles, and as well as a ground electrode. Using the Acknowledge software, we were able to record and analyze this data. And we were able to record from up to six muscles at a time due to the sampling rate, and we chose these at random. We also synced the videos with the crawl sequence, with the EMG data, so we can see exactly what, when the muscles are activating, what is the fish doing. We use multiple individuals for multiple crawls. Uh, just basically try to get as many crawls out of each fish as we could. And because we only got six out of the 12 muscles at a time, using different recordings from different muscles and different combinations, we were able to patch together an overall muscle activity pattern. So here's a video of what the EMG looks like. Uh, notice, uh, notice all the wires going in. You can see some wires. Yeah, in the right oh, here. that's what we want. Along with uh, hopefully not pulling out the electrodes right away. Uh, it was a little frustrating at first, but here's what the data we get from that crawl sequence looks like. So it's a lot going on. Uh, on the left is muscle groups, and you can see there's an overall muscle activity pattern. It's hard to discern what it is, but there's definitely a pattern here. Uh, so to simplify this, I use the start and end time of their muscle, relative start and end time of each muscle activation, as well as their duration, and I developed this graphic. Uh, to explain what you're seeing here, on the left is the muscle groups, or is the individual muscles. On the right, uh, the bars, the thick bars represent the average start and end time of a muscle activation. 
and deactivation. And the thin bars represent the standard error. On the bottom, it says 0 to 100%, and that's showing uh, the percent of the cycle. Because it's a cyclical behavior, uh, the, the start is an arbitrary time, depending on as long as we're consistent. So I chose the right anterior hypaxial as the start uh, because we had the most recordings for it. The, e the numbers on each bar is the number of strides recorded. Uh, so each muscle, let's say right anterior hypaxial, had 42 side sequences going into this data. And we define a stride as moving on both sides. So like you move your body left, you move your body right, and then you bring it back. So it's a full cyclical behavior. Uh, you can see there's an overall left and right muscle activity pattern, at least with the axial body. Um, they're about 50% 50 uh, 50 of the cycle out of phase, showing that, that, which makes sense because they move left and move right. That, that just makes sense. If you notice the pectoral fins, though, the, they're, act, they're moving twice per cycle, which is unusual because no other fish on land really seems to do that except mud skippers, which keep their body completely still uh, and just move their pectoral fins. And no fish really do that in water except for labriform swimmers like wrasses, which will keep their body rigid while using both pectoral fins at the same time. So it's doing a little bit of different behavior than if it was trying to swim on land. Additionally, you can see that um, while there may be some uh, site phase delay uh, in the anterior and posterior muscles, particularly uh, really easy to see in the uh, right side, the axial muscles, there's, uh, they're about at the same time. Um, compared to undulatory fish swimmers, um, undulatory swimmers like the uh, mackerels you see in there, the eels, there seems to be a lot more phase delay. So it would suggest that the, the snakeheads are doing more an oscillatory behavior rather than undulatory behavior. The amount of delay seen in their, actual, uh, their anterior and posterior muscles seems more closer, uh, seems closer to, say, the tuna on top, which is a very little phase delay for the muscle activity. So they're more, they're more on the spectrum towards oscillation than undulation. Overall, snakeheads use an effective axial appendage-based terrestrial locom uh, locomotor behavior and it's distinct from their swimming kinematics. They're not trying to swim on land, they're doing something different. And they're not trying to move randomly, they're doing a stereotype behavior. Because their orders of magnitude larger than the sculpins, they may be having to move using different kinematics than sculpins to be able to move their larger body mass around on land. Substrate has an impact on their terrestrial performance. Slope substrates allow them to work with gravity, go, towards, go downhill, presumably where water would be. And three-dimensional substrates like grass allow them to get a better grip so they can move better when they have more stuff to push off of. We found, at least in our size range of about 30 to 70 centimeters, size can have a huge impact on their performance, but perhaps uh, smaller individuals will be more impacted by size. And because they can breathe air and they can effectively move over land, it gives them some potential to move and disperse over land. So for the next steps of the project, I'm going to be doing uh, immersion experiments starting Friday. We're going to go collect about hopefully 200 little snakeheads. If you have any tips on where to find them, please let me know. And I'm going to treat, uh, expose them to a variety of ecological and environmental conditions to see is there any extreme condition that will cause them to voluntarily leave the water, uh, whether it's extreme temperatures, pH, hydrogen sulfide levels, precipitation. Is there any condition where they will voluntarily go on land? And if they will voluntarily go on land, they can move well on land and they can breathe air, then it gives potential for them to disperse over land. I'd like to thank uh, Tim and Mary Groves and the rest of the Cedarville, uh, Maryland Department of Natural Resources office for their help allowing me to use their facility and help me collect all the snakeheads. And I'd like to thank the National Science Foundation for funding my research. I'd be happy to take any questions you may have. So the question was, uh, have I looked into the moving upslopes? On some of the tilted boat decks, they would actually go the other way, uphill. So some of them actually move very well up the slope, so they can move uphill. They probably prefer to move downhill, but so do we. Uh, yeah.
So the question was, can they move 75 yards or long distances over land? We, uh, we didn't track the, the overall distance. We're just trying to look at, describe their behavior and performance. But you saw the one on grass, that, mo that specific video, that one moved about a meter in a second or two, in a couple seconds. So that's not an insignificant difference uh, distance, especially if they can breathe air. So if it's, let's say, a cloudy day, a little bit of mud, a little bit of moisture, they should be fine taking their time to move a good distance over land. Mm So I haven't actually observed any actual terrestrial locomotion in the wild, personally. I've heard um, was it Tim Groves is telling me how he's been electrofishing and seen snakeheads, little snakeheads on top of lily pads. Uh, and there's mostly, I've heard anecdotal res uh, information, like a fisherman catches it and sees it move around on land. But my guess is it's just a, it's not a super common behavior. And so I'm gonna try to next week figure out what conditions will lead to this behavior. Yes, that makes sense. Um, I mean, it does make sense if, uh, let's say, th they get flooded onto a field and the, f uh, the water starts drying up and they get stranded on the field, they may have to move around the land to get out of it. Uh, but I've seen something in um, killifish, uh, fundalists specifically, uh, is if they're in a tide pool that is draining and drying up, they won't wait until the pool completely dries up. They will voluntarily leave the pool and move to the next pool uh, before it completely dries up. So there is potential for snakeheads to do a similar behavior. If they see they're in a stagnant ditch and that's drying up, they may take action and move out of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my guess is it's mostly a survival uh, behavior, but if like during that behavior, if they get stranded on land, they may not move back to the original body of water. They may just move randomly until they find a nearest body of water or uh, they may use some signals, just uh, other work I've done on, on killifish, they'll look for like reflections and they may just follow reflections to find the nearest body of water to move back to. Mm -hmm. So you're saying your your question is uh, how much how much could the behavior of the snakeheads to be foraging or the sculpins, the snakeheads? Snake mm -hmm. So I think it's unlikely the snakeheads are actively foraging on land. Um, some a lot of studies on fish show that you the fish can't swallow out of water unless except certain types of walking catfishes essentially carry water in their mouth and use that as like a tongue to kind of spit it out and suck it back in uh, because they ha they can't they have to use water to swallow and help move fish down their digest and uh, move prey down their digestive system they probably can't forage much on land they may go out to the water's edge and grab a frog and pull it back in uh, to swallow it but they I think it's unlikely they're going onto land and actively foraging like the snakehead horror movie show. Yeah. I think that actually uh, helps them move in a he heavily vegetated um, environment. This the tidal sculpins move around in very rocky intertidal zone, and they're very small. So just kind of rotating and moving over small rocks, uh, their behavior, lifting their body up, helps them do that. Whereas the snakeheads, uh, they're not gonna lift their body up with their weak little pectoral fins. They're too small to support their body weight. 
So I'm thinking they may just be pushing along and using their actual body to, to mostly do, do the movements, but they can push off, let's say, grass and help them move around in a more three-dimensional substrate. Is there any more questions? All right, thank you. Just a couple comments before we wrap up this session. Um, if any presenters still have yet to load their talks, get with me or one of the uh, AV guys over here and we'll get your talk loaded. And uh, for everybody, lunch is on your own. Be back here shortly before 1.10, maybe between 1 and 1.10 so we can get started on time. Thank you. Go get your picture taken with the snakehead out there. <laughs> <laughs>